welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to look at intermolecular forces. I have a video on my channel looking at intermolecular forces already, which goes through the definitions of the different trends that you need to know on the periodic table, and it also outlines the different intermolecular forces. Today's video will go into more detail about the intermolecular forces and allow you a chance to practice some questions looking at properties caused by forces. First of all, let's look at the bonding in the first 20 elements, which is a diatomic element of H2, followed by helium, which is a noble gas and therefore monatomic. We then have two metallic elements, lithium and beryllium, followed by our first covalent network, boron. We then have carbon, which has two covalent networks, diamond and graphite. In diamond, all the carbons are joined to four others. In graphite, they're bond bonded to three others in a sheet. Carbon can also exist as a molecule called the fullerenes, C60 being the most famous. We then have nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, which are all diatomic, and then our next noble gas, neon. We go back to the metallic elements. We have sodium, magnesium, and aluminium, before we have our last covalent network, which is silicon. We then have two other small molecules, phosphorus, which is P4, and sulfur, which is S8, and then our last diatomic element, chlorine, Cl2. Argon, number 18, is a noble gas. And then we finish with two metallic elements, potassium and calcium. Covalent bonding. Let's define this first. This occurs between non-metal atoms where they're held together by an attraction for the shared pair of electrons between their nuclei. So if we represent the nuclei as these red positive circles, we then have two electron shells which overlap and within the overlap region we have electrons. Each nuclei is attracted to the electrons within the shared region. The nuclei cannot come too close together because they would then repel and they cannot move too far apart because then they wouldn't be able to feel the attraction for the electrons. Electronegativity, you need to know the definition for electronegativity. So electronegativity is the attraction for a shared pair of electrons. You can find the electronegativity scale on page 11 of your data book. So a high electronegativity, for example something like fluorine, means you have a high attraction. A low electronegativity, for example something like cesium, means you have a low attraction. So how does this affect bonding? So non-polar covalent bonds occur between atoms which have the same electronegativity. This means that they have an equal share for the electrons. So if we're to represent the electrons here as the pink dots, they will be exactly in the middle of the two atoms. Polar covalent bonds happen between atoms which have a difference in electronegativity. So here, if we decide that Y is more electronegative than X, the electrons will sit closer to Y than to X, and we can represent this with a delta minus and a delta positive to show that the Y end of the molecule is more negative than the X because we have an unequal share of electrons. 
So nonpolar covalent molecules occur in two occasions. So either you have all pure or nonpolar equivalent bonds, or you have a symmetrical molecule where the bonds are polar. For example, in carbon dioxide, the CO bonds are polar bonds. However, the molecule is overall symmetrical and therefore nonpolar. Polar covalent molecules have polar covalent bonds and these are arranged asymmetrically. For example, in trichloromethane, we have three CCl bonds and one CH bond. So we have an asymmetrical molecule where we have a dipole formed where the bottom of the molecule where the CLs are is negative, whereas the top is positive. Using this information, we can place bonding onto a continuum. So at the extreme left here, we have nonpolar covalent. This is where we have no difference in electronegativity. For example, in a fluorine molecule, which is diatomic, they both have the same electronegativity and therefore the electrons are equally shared between the two fluorines. Polar covalent molecules occur when there is a small difference in electronegativity. For example, if we had hydrogen bonded to fluorine, in this case, the fluorine is more negative than the hydrogen. And then finally, ionic is where there is a very large difference in electronegativity. So this would be where we have ions formed and the electrons are transferred completely, such as the case of sodium fluoride. Pause the video now and decide if each molecule would be described as polar or nonpolar. So in the first example, we have CH4. There is a tiny difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen, but it's often regarded as a nonpolar bond. This is also a symmetrical molecule, and therefore, even with the small difference in electronegativity, this molecule would be nonpolar. Here we have sulfur and hydrogen. We have a small difference in electronegativity, and it's been arranged in an asymmetrical fashion. This means that this molecule would be polar. Nitrogen and chlorine both have an electronegativity of 3. This means that this is a nonpolar molecule. And then finally, we have carbon and chlorine. We have a difference in electronegativity between carbon and chlorine. However, we have four chlorines arranged symmetrically around the carbon, making this overall a nonpolar molecule. Intermolecular forces occur between molecular elements and compounds and also between monatomic gases. There are three types of intermolecular forces or van der Waals forces, and which is present depends on the bonding within the molecule. Going from London dispersion forces to hydrogen bonding, we have an increase in strength. Molecules which have hydrogen bonding tend to have higher melting po and boiling points and be more viscous than those with only London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces occur between all monatomic gases and all molecules. They're caused by an attraction between the temporary dipole on one molecule and an induced temporary dipole on a neighbouring molecule. Temporary dipoles occur due to electron clouds which are constantly moving. We can represent this with a diagram. So here we can represent the nucleus as a positive charge and then we have a cloud of electrons around the nuclei. This cloud of electrons is constantly moving. If the cloud of electrons on one molecule moves to one side of that molecule, then we end up with one side of the molecule being slightly positive and one being slightly negative. This is our temporary dipole. The neighbouring molecule will react to this and we'll have an induced temporary dipole. 
it will also have a slightly positive and slightly negative side. The slightly negative side of one molecule will be attracted to the slightly positive side of the neighbouring molecule. This is what we would call a London dispersion force. Permanent dipole-permanent dipole interactions are in addition to London dispersion forces. They are stronger than London's they are stronger than London dispersion forces and they occur in polar molecules. They are an attraction between the permanent dipole on one molecule and the permanent dipole on a neighbouring molecule. Again, we can represent this with a diagram. So here, chlorine is slightly negative and hydrogen is slightly positive. This is because chlorine has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen. These molecules will then line themselves up in such a way that the permanent negative side of the HCl faces the permanent positive side of the HCl on a neighbouring molecule. The attraction between the slightly negative and slightly positive sides is our permanent dipole permanent dipole interaction. Because the molecules are have a permanent dipole, this means that this arrangement can always be present and is therefore stronger. The final type of intermolecular forces is hydrogen bonding. This works in the same way as permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions. But this is for molecules with very specific bonds. That is bonds between hydrogen and nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen and fluorine. These bonds have a high electronegativity difference. This means that hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. So here we can represent using water molecules. The oxygen on water is slightly negative and the hydrogen is slightly positive. The attraction between the slightly positive and slightly negative ends of the different molecules is the hydrogen bonding. Intermolecular forces affect different properties. Viscosity can, de can be described as the thickness of a liquid. For example, honey is very viscous, whereas water is not. The stronger the intermolecular force that is present, the more viscous a liquid will be. For melting and boiling point, the stronger the intermolecular force present, the higher the melting and boiling point. This is because more energy is needed to overcome the interactions between the molecules. Volatility is how easily a substance evaporates. The stronger the intermolecular force is present, the less volatile a substance will be, as it will require more energy to evaporate. For solubility, we follow the like dissolves like rule. This means that polar substances are soluble in water, as it is also polar, and therefore they can set up permanent dipole, permanent dipole, or hydrogen bonding between their molecules. Pause the video now and try and answer this question. Okay, the first thing we need to have a look at is the bonding in each of the molecules. Each of the molecules contains carbon to chlorine bonds, which are polar bonds. However, if we have a look at the arrangement of these bonds, we can see how the molecules differ. Within trichloromethane, we only have three carbon to chlorine bonds. This means that they are arranged asymmetrically around the carbon, making this overall have a dipole in this direction. Because we have a permanent dipole, this is a polar molecule. This molecule will have permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions. Within tetrachloromethane, there is no overall dipole because it's symmetrical. Because the molecule is symmetrical, it's nonpolar. This means that the only interactions we will have will be London dispersion forces. Because trichloromethane is polar, 
it is able to dissolve in water. Whereas tetrachloromethane, which is not polar, cannot dissolve in water. Pause the video now and try this second example. Sulfur has a higher melting point than phosphorus. Explain fully with reference to intermolecular forces why this is the case. So first of all, we need to understand what the structure difference is between sulfur and phosphorus. Within sulfur, you have rings of S8. In phosphorus, you have molecules of P4. This means that there are more electrons within your sulfur molecule. If you have more electrons, you have a larger electron cloud and therefore stronger London dispersion forces. If you have stronger London dispersion forces, more energy is needed to overcome the intermolecular forces and melt the substance. Pause the video now and try this example. Silicon nitride has a melting point of 1,900 degrees and does not conduct electricity when molten. Explain fully in terms of structure and bonding why silicon nitride has a high melting point. So this is asking you to understand the different properties of the different types of bonding. So we have a very high melting point and it does not conduct electricity when molten. When we melt silicon nitride we must not be producing ions, therefore this is pointing towards this having a covalent network structure. If you have a covalent network structure, then large amounts of energy are required to overcome the covalent bonds between all of the atoms within the structure. To melt a covalent network, you need to break every covalent bond within the structure. This requires a huge amount of energy. Pause the video now and try this final question. The melting point of non-metal elements depends on the structure and bonding. Using your knowledge of chemistry, comment on this statement. So for non-metal elements, we have four different types of bonding and structure that are present. So the first is monatomic. We have this for the noble gases. They have no bonding between their atoms and they have London dispersion forces only. London dispersion forces are easy to overcome and therefore you have a low melting point for the noble gases. Next we have diatomic molecules. We have gases in the form of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and chlorine. We have liquid, bromine and solid, iodine. As you move from the gases to the liquid to the solid, you have increasing strength of London dispersion forces. You have other small molecules. You have sulfur, which is S8, phosphorus P4, and carbon C60, and they are all solids. So they have stronger London dispersion forces because they are bigger molecules. And then finally, you have the networks. You have carbon, boron and silicon. These all have high melting points. They have covalent bonds between all atoms and these need to be broken to melt the substance. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for regular updates on new videos and Miss Adams Chemistry for flashcards throughout the year. Bye for now!